Fantasia di sarciolia, figlietta mia, tra la la, la luna e mezzo ma, tra la la, la luna e mezzo ma, c'è la luna e mezzo mare, mamma mia me maritare, figlia mia cud da dare, mamma mia pensaci tu. Ti vo daro ci tra laro e dove e dove ne sempre ci trulli mano te Se ci piglia fantasia ti tricioli a fusa mia tra la 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 luna in mezzo ma tra la 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 luna in mezzo ma C'è la luna in mezzo mare mamma mia me maritare Figlia mia, tu da dare, mamma mia, pensaci tu. Ti vo daro panatiere, e dove, e dove ne sempre a sciabola in mano te. Se ci figlia fantasia, ti impallo, mia figlia mia, tra la la, la luna è buona, tra la la, la luna è Can you tell me a little bit about the history of the Santa Cruz Italian fishing colony? Well, in about the 1870s and 1880s, a number of Italian sailors sailed along the Pacific mm. coast and they settled here, uh, gradually at first for fishing. And then as the years passed on, they brought their families here from a small town in Italy, Riva Tregoso. Mm. Most of them were related. There was a very tight kinship process going on. Essentially, there were four families at first, the Stagneros, the Loueros, the Guillos, and there was another one. Who is it, Rico? With the Cushy. Yeah, the Carnillas. No, the Brigantes. There yeah. we go. Brigantes, Mary's father. My father came in 1885 the first time. Then he went back, then stayed two years home, then come back again. Then he stayed two years, then he went back again. And in 1897, he went back home. I was born in 1898, and of March of 1899, they came to America. And my mother said she'll never take a trip again like that because it was a sail ship. <laughs> and she was so frightened of the storms that there was there. She never got over it. When I was a marinaio, I si navigava lì da Genova al paese. E si andava a caricare di vini in Sicilia e nelle Puglie, nella Grecia. E ho fatto tanti viaggi di con lei. Ma dove sei nato? Sono, sono nato a Riva Trigoso. Provincia di Genova. La provincia di Genova è il dipartimento di Spezia. They've come a long ways, you got to give them credit, boy. They come to this country with a, a language barrier and didn't know anyone. And into the, and and into right the, the earthquake earth. and lost everything. Listen, my mother came to this country just as a girl and in 1905. In 1906, they landed, in, they came to San Francisco in 1905. In 1906, the earthquake hit them. She was pregnant in seven months, a language barrier, no money, no nothing. Can you imagine? Can you picture yourself? Right, now listen, there was one more thing there about Was that. anybody born on the boat when they yes, came Yes, wait a minute, down? wait a minute. Lots of my, 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 yeah. my, uh, my cousin Jim, uh -huh. Jim Knepper, right. they're cousins of ours. My, his cousin. mother and my mother were sisters, uh -huh. okay? When my father took this boat and sailed it to, uh, to Sausalito, uh -huh. the, the, uh, Jim was about a year old. And they had put him, my father had saved a mattress, and he put it under the deck, and it was raining. The little Jim was laying there and it was leaking through the roof and he was taking water in his mouth. Almost My right. mother went down to see if he was all right and he would have drowned it. And the guy's still alive. <laughs> still alive. Yeah. Come sei venuto in America, Marco? Sono venuto che aveva 28 anni. 28 anni. 28 anni. De, 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 de
E sei venuto qui a Santa Croce? Santa Croce. E come sei venuto? E sono venuto che andavo a pescare, c'era quelli che mi conoscevano, mi hanno dato la chance per pescare. They lived just above the wharf on the Barranca, the banks above the wharf, and they began their business here. Some became fish sellers, others became fishermen. Well, they influenced the fishing community because the wharf was the center for the fishing community at the time. Mm. Not only was it the place where the fish were sold, it was the place where the fishermen left the wharf to, to go out to fish. They came back, mm. they brought their fish here, they worked on their nets, they baited their long lines. It was mm. the social center, it was where the men congregated. Uh, the women would come down and work in the fish houses. Well, my mother, uh, when we lived in Santa Cruz, my dad had a wagon and a horse. He had two horses, but he sold one and kept one. And uh, my mother, she'd go peddle the fish for my dad the next day. And how did she peddle the fish? Well, she'd have this little horn, you know, and she'd blow it. And of course, the customers knew her and they'd come out. <clears throat> And uh, they knew that she was there by blowing that little horn. And then she'd holler. <laughs> she'd holler, freshy fish, you know. Oh, she spoke broken a little. Sometimes I'd ask him why he was doing it, you know. And he'd explain. When you were young, did you go down to the wharf very often? Well, I can read the first time I recollect I was about three years old. I went fishing. My mother passed away when I was two and a half. And nobody was there to take care of me. So we'd ought to be down in the basket under the boat to be fishing. I was so scared, I guess that's why it remained on my memory. Of course you had the fish when they were very calm, they'd be mending nets. They were all my friends. I respected them yeah. to the best that anybody would know how because yeah. my father put that into me when he saw, he used to always tell me, uh -huh. well, when you see one of the fishermen, being that I was maybe the youngest uh -huh. Italian on the wharf at that particular uh -huh. times, he says, I always want you to say good morning first. Uh -huh. I want you to say good morning, Chile. <laughs> I want you to say good morning, Bargung. Uh -huh. I want you to say good morning, Meneghin. Uh -huh. I want you to go to Good morning, Bazanoa, uh -huh. uh, Kile, uh -huh. Kuming. I want you to always respect those people first. Now, another thing about the Italian fishermen, they were all good cooks. Oh boy, you're not oh. Half of them would come, <laughs> they would come home at night time, they'd get themselves cleaned up. If, if whatever she cooked, they didn't like, they wouldn't scoff. No. They'd cook it for themselves, and it was good. It was good. I mean, it was good. It's what they call today gourmet food, and we had it every night. Every night. That's, <laughs> That's the right. Truth. That's the truth. No my kidding. Father, my father said to me, go get a little bit of garlic. Get a little bit of garlic. Yeah. Oh, and boy, and they were all good cooks. Good. All of them. Good. All of them. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. My father made the best uh, risotto with, uh, with um, uh, purple. Uh, oh, with, boy. Uh, what do they call it? Devil fish? Oh. <laughs> they were dressed in the old ways that they dressed in their mother country. Uh-huh. They wore their berets, and they used to wear the centers around for belts, you know. And they had boots on, rubber boots on, and uh, they were very colorful. Il mare come bello, spira tanto sentimento, come il tuo suave accento, che me desto da sognare. Senti come lieve sale, dai giardini odor d'aranci, un profumo non va uguale, per chi palpito d'amore, e tu dici ho parto ad io, t'allontani dal mio cuore. Ma non mi fuggire, 
non darmi più tormento, torna fishermen. Were the Italian fishermen ever very accepted in the community? Mm. Never really at first. Like most immigrant people, they were they were looked down upon by the established community. They lived in a very tight community themselves. They never went out of the community mm -hmm. much. My grandmother, for instance, lived here nearly all her life, 75, 80 years. She never learned to speak English. My mother told me when they went to school that uh, they were called Wops and Dagos a lot of time. Their ancestry was questioned on a number of occasions. Well, as the years went by, I, I always, as the years went by, I got into the sixth grade. Miss McClellan was my teacher. What happened then? Osborne sat right across from me. We had the windows on this side. He sat here and I sat here. Mm -hmm. And he puts his head down after we come in, in at recess and complain that he had a headache. Osborne, when did you get your headache? Did you have one when you come to school? No, but I smell garlic. Then I know, on account of them, they put the spirit, fighting spirit for me, that during the war I fought for my people. So these people are innocent. And I said, uh, I didn't say nothing there. And I was naked. My hand was shaking like this. Miss, Mr. Miss McClellan comes down. She says, Mary, don't eat garlic and disturb the class. <laughs> I didn't say anything. But in here, I was born. Okay, could I go tell my mother those things? Could I go tell my father those things? No. So I come home in the bedroom and start praying. Dear Lord, despite me what I'm going to do. I don't want to tell my mother. I don't want to tell my father. I have no brothers. What am I going to do? So I raised up. Something in my heart said, Mary, take the biggest head of garlic in the box, bring it in school. When she calls a roll, bang it down on the desk get to school, and recess, there he complains. I jumped out of that seat, I banged the garlic, it went all over the floor. She said, stop that. You go against me telling you not to eat it, and you bring it to school and disturb the class. I jumped out of the seat. I said, look, Miss McClellan, I didn't eat garlic the day before yesterday. I did eat it yesterday, but now he can smell it, eat it, do what he want. All over the floor he went, stop it. I said, no, ma'am, you've been punishing me innocently, and I'm not going to take no more of this. I have no brothers. I have, I'm the oldest one in my family, and I'm fighting for my rights, and I have the crucifix in here. This is my judge right here. She turned around to her husband. She said, shame on you, accusing this girl and having me punishing her when you were the guilty party. She says, Osborne, you have no more respect for me. You get in that corner and you stay there. Don't you turn around. And he got up, I said, eh, you thought you could beat a Dago, didn't you? <laughs> During the days of the uh, old Latin boats with their sails, the wind would drop on them up the coast. Uh huh. And they would have to row for 10 or 12 miles. My Lord. And that was a, a long, long session. And uh, singing relieved their, uh, their tensions. And then uh, I discovered later that uh, many of them had uh, phonographs, even the old type that you wound up by hand. Uh -huh. And they would buy the records of Caruso. Oh, the fishermen? The fishermen would. And they'd listen to them on the, the phonograph. And then they'd sing right along with them. Oh. Now Marco Cornelia did this. Mm -hmm.